Common Core. You've heard about it? And over the coming months, it'll be in the news even more as new parts of it continue to unfold. Common Core is not something that's going away, even though it sure needs to. But because it's still a work in progress, today we're going to look and cover some of the new problems that have emerged since we covered this topic three months ago. So let me begin by first acknowledging what we as constitutional conservatives know and believe. Our kids are one of America's most precious resources. Like snowflakes, God made each and every one of them unique. They all have different personalities. They all have different strengths and different interests and different skill sets. But our government education system today insists on treating them as if they're all just the same, trying to cram every one of them into a government shape and government defined mold. And that's one of the underlying problems with Common Core. They want to make everybody look and think the same. Now, it's definitely true that there are certain minimum amounts of academic knowledge that every student needs in order to be a good citizen, but kids aren't even getting this academic knowledge at school today. And one of the biggest selling points from Common Core proponents is their claim of increased academic rigor in their standards. Yeah, maybe, but recent evidence sure seems to suggest otherwise. Look at this article, notice this. Students in Kentucky were the first to undergo the Common Core's testing regimen. The state adopted the standards in 2010. One year later, its students' scores fell across the board by roughly a third in reading and math. And look at this headline. First empirical evidence, Common Core hurts Kentucky students. Now, there's also been other stories like this from other states, and so, yeah, maybe that's academic rigor, maybe it's not. But for anybody who truly is concerned about academic rigor, I suggest that you look backward. Did you know that until the early part of the 20th century, American kids finished school at eighth grade? That's as far as they went, not the 12 grades we have today. So talking about academic rigor, try answering a few exit questions from an eighth grade graduation test. And this is from Kansas in 1895, okay? Easy stuff, eighth grade. Grammar. Number one, give nine rules for the use of capital letters. Anybody want to take a shot at that? Look at this one. Here's name the parts of speech and define those that have no modifications. That's eighth grade in 1895. Well, let's move on from grammar. Let's move down to something like arithmetic. District number 33 has a valuation of $35,000. What is the necessary levy to carry on a school seven months at $50 per month and still have $105 left over for incidentals? Eighth grade math. Try this one. Find a bank discount on $300 for 90 days, no grace, at 10%. That's eighth grade math. Let's move from math and let's go on over to orthography. And orthography means, it means spelling and composition is what we would call it, spelling and writing. What's meant by the following, by the following terms? Alphabet, phonetic, orthography, etymology, syllabification. Next question, what are the following and give examples of each? Trigraph, subvocals, diphthong, cognate letters, and lingual. Again, eighth grade. Let's go over to geography and look at some questions in geography. Name all the republics of Europe and give the capital of each. What are you going to bet most folks can't even name the states of the United States and their capitals, but now we're doing the republics of Europe and all their capitals? And look at this geography question. Why is the Atlantic coast colder than the Pacific coast at the same latitude? You couldn't get out of eighth grade unless you could handle this. Now, this is academic rigor. I think we all agree that this constitutes academic rigor, rigor and this is in 1895 without the benefit of calculators or computers. You see, back then, kids were actually required to use their brain. But in case you find these eighth grade questions to be a bit too hard, let's back up a bit more and try some fourth grade questions from 1862. Now, here's a fourth grade, tw notice this. This is in Chicago, 1862. You have 35 minutes for this test, fourth grade ge geography. Here's fourth grade questions. How many degrees of longitude are there? How many degrees wide are the temperate zones? Name the principal animals of the frigid zone. Look at this one. What portion of the people in the globe are pagans? What portion Christians? That's fourth grade stuff. You see, this old stuff represents true academic rigor. Education day is moving further and further away from it, and Common Core certainly seems to be contributing. And maybe part of the problem is the new teaching methods that are associated with teaching Common Core. Look at this clip from M.J. McDermott, a local television personality in Washington State. 
She's going to explain one of the crazy new ways that math is being taught there. Watch this. Another popular algorithm taught in everyday math is the lattice method. Same problem, 26 times 31. This time we have to set up a lattice. It works like this. We put the 26 on top and the 31 along the side like that. And then we draw these diagonals. And then we do 1 times 6 and fill it in like that, 0, 6. 3 times 6, 18. 1 times 2, no effort to say 1 times 20, by the way, 0, 2. And 3 times 2, 0, 6. Now we add it up along the diagonal. 6, 8, 0 plus 2 is 10. Carry the 1. 6, 7, 8 times n 0 is 8 and a zero there. And the answer is read this way. There's your answer, 806. It's kind of fun. It works every time. But even the authors of Everyday Math admit in their teacher's manual why the lattice method works is not immediately obvious, but it is very efficient and powerful. The principal disadvantages of the algorithm are that it is unfamiliar to many adults, i.e. parents, and making the lattice takes time. Okay, so teaching this new lattice method of working problems is going to help student knowledge? Mm, I don't think so. But you see, this is one of the fundamental problems with progressives. It doesn't matter how well something is already working or how long it's been working well. They're always wanting change. They're always wanting to move forward or lean forward. And they want to leave the old things behind. You see, progressives are all about progress after all. They want to implement the new, even if the old works well and the new doesn't. And did you notice that MJ pointed out that parents will not know the lattice method? So parents won't even be able to help their own kids with math. And this is also part of what progressives do. They want everyone dependent on them. They, they want the kids to rely on government officials for their knowledge and help, not on their parents. But let's not stop with just using new and and impossible teaching methods. Let's look at this clip from a recent educational conference and notice a statement that kids getting the right answer is not necessarily the overall objective of progressive math education. Watch this. Even under the new Common Core, if, even if they said 3 times 4 was 11, if they were able to explain their reasoning and explain how they came up with their answer really in um, words and oral explanations, and they showed it in the picture, but they just got the final number wrong. We're really more focusing on the how. The right answer doesn't really matter, just how you got it. Okay, now I understand. Uh, maybe she was trying to say that it was important for kids to know why things worked. That is to know the process behind getting the right answer. And, uh, that's fine. All right, I buy that. But to say that in education under Common Core, we're not going to focus on getting right answers? How about getting right answers and getting the process? You see, maybe this is why test scores dropped in Kentucky. Who knows? But in addition to all of these immediate problems, Common Core also presents serious problems for the future of the republic. Common Core. It's the new national educational initiative that not only weakens local and state controls of education, but also fundamentally changes what students will learn. For example, standards teach that the future of the planet is threatened by man-made global warming. But there has been no global warming for almost two decades, and this despite the steadily rising atmospheric carbon dioxide that supposedly drives global warming. And we're also told that global warming's melting of the polar ice caps would cause sea rise and massive coastal flooding. Yet ice is actually expanding in Antarctica, which has 90% of the Earth's ice. And it even turns out that data was misrepresented by global warming alarmists to make recent temperatures look warmer than they've actually been and past temperatures look cooler. Yet none of these facts prevent Common Core from making man-made global warming a fundamental part of its education standards. This is not education, it's political indoctrination. Just one more of the many reasons why Common Core is bad for students, 
bad for states and bad for America. And here's another one on a different issue. Common Core, maybe you've heard of it. It's the new national educational initiative that not only weakens local and state controls of education, but also fundamentally changes what students will learn. For example, under Common Core, cursive handwriting will no longer be taught. But that sounds reasonable. After all, kids send text, Facebook, and email messages to each other, so who needs cursive writing? But this means that students will no longer be able to read the journals of George Washington, or the letters of John Adams, Thomas Jefferson, or James Madison, or for that matter, even the Constitution or the Declaration of Independence, which are written in cursive. In fact, students won't even be able to read the letters that their own grandparents or great-grandparents may have written and saved for their family's heritage. Under Common Core, cursive writing will become a language as foreign to students as ancient Egyptian hieroglyphics. Removing a student's ability to directly study American historical documents is just one of the many reasons why Common Core is bad for students, bad for states, and bad for America. Contact your legislators and let them know that you oppose Common Core. I tell you, it's not a good thing not to be able to read early American documents for yourself. In fact, let me tell you how I first got involved in history some years ago. I was a school principal, and I read some really old documents that I'd been taught about in school. But when I read those actual documents for myself, I found that those documents were dramatically different from what my teachers and textbooks had taught me about those documents. That's when we started collecting documents. And now we have more than 100,000 originals or copies of originals from before 1812. Every student should be able to read America's founding documents for themselves, but that becomes much harder with Common Core. And in addition to the lack of academic rigor in Common Core, the dumb teaching methods used, and severing us from the ability to check our own history, there's also the data mining part of Common Core. Remember this article from The Blaze? Indoctrination, data mining, and common core. Here's why America's schools may be in more trouble than you think. And remember this article? American Thinker. There seems to be little recognition yet that the common core gives schools and third parties unprecedented access to students' personal information. The federal government is acquiring a massive amount of data that can be sold to the highest bidders. So, they'll take our private data? Well, that really shouldn't worry anyone. I mean, we trust the government to do the right thing with all that data they're going to collect from our kids about us. And, and if you want proof, you want proof they'll do the right thing? That's easy. Just think of how well the NSA and the IRS have protected and respected our personal data. I mean, so what's to worry? Okay, so maybe there is some history of the government agencies abusing our personal data. But remember, this data collected about us from our kids can be sold to private groups. And what's so bad about that? All you have to do is listen to what David Coleman has to say, and you can immediately see the problems and the dangers. David Coleman is the president of the College Board, and they're the ones who produce the SAT test for college-bound students. Time Magazine calls him, quote, the architect in education because, as they explain, his quiet work behind the scenes on the proposed Common Core Standards makes him among the most influential figures in American education today. So David Coleman, who definitely strongly supports Common Core, is going to give us an example of how private information can be used in sophisticated ways to advance progressive causes. Listen to this clip of him at a New York educational conference. Let's remember who really won the election. Shall we call it Nate Silver? Against all the blowhards of political commentary, the predictions of the nerds were decisive. But perhaps more exciting than the person who stood to the side and handicapped the election is the person who led the Obama campaign's use of data to galvanize a generation of low-income people to vote like they had never had before. Whether you are Republican or Democrat, the simple precision and excellence of the use of information to achieve a result is something in my mind that deserves astonishment. It means, again, that there is no force greater. Think about it. Think about it. Hundreds of millions of dollars spent on this campaign. And what made the difference, right? A lot of things. 
But this incredible precision and insight gained from data, not only knowing where people are, but testing various interventions, seeing what works, keeping focused on delivering them. Um, that's not how I want my private information used. And I don't care whether it's for the Obama campaign or anybody else's campaign. I don't want the government collecting more information about me. And I especially don't want it done through my unsuspecting kids. Using our kids to push progressive agendas is despicable. Recall this story? The Los Angeles Un Unified School District will use a state grant to train teens to promote Obamacare to family members. Covered California, the state's health insurance agents exchange announced grants of 37 million to promote the nationally unpopular law. So wait a minute, we're going to school to teach our kids to go home and promote a nationally unpopular law. We're, we're using them to deliver the mechanism. This, this isn't right. And that's one of the potential problems that occurs with the data mining through Common Core. And by the way, Common Core understands that they're starting to take a beating from the, the public right now. So they've changed the name of their most recent product to, quote, next generation science standards. Now, it doesn't say Common Core, but it's still the same thing. We have a saying in Texas that you can put lipstick on a pig, but it's still a pig. Well, they dropped the name Common Core from the new science standards, but that's just their lipstick. So these are just a few of the problems with Common Core that have emerged in recent months, and there are certainly many others as well. Did you know that today, the most powerful force in shaping education, philosophy, and knowledge is testing? Testing drives everything about education. Let me explain. I've been officially appointed in numerous states to help write their social studies standards. Well, a few years back when we did the last set of standards in Texas, an interesting discussion arose. There were some 15 of us who did the standards, and we were praised for producing such a great set of standards, but I pointed out that, you know, good standards don't ensure good content in the textbooks. I've often seen textbook publishers go in the direction they want to go rather than the direction set forth in the standards that they're supposed to follow. Now, in my case, I'm also often asked by publishers to help write their textbooks, so I sometimes get two shots at making sure kids get good content. I get one with writing the social studies standards and one with helping write the textbooks. But even that's not enough. Why? Because the test drives the entire process in education day. School funding and even teacher pay raises can be tied to student performance on tests. So teachers teach through the content of the test rather than the content either of the textbooks or the standards. So whoever writes the test ultimately determines what students will be taught and what they will learn. And there's something else you should know about educational testing. Two decades ago, a number of standardized tests were used in schools across the nation. Some schools used the Iowa Test of Basic Skills, and others used the Stanford Achievement Test, and others used the California Achievement Test. And, and by the way, the California Achievement Test is one we use in our school, and it was introduced back in the 1950s. Now, in the school in Texas where I was a principal, that California Achievement Test, we used it. And those tests, all those tests were used across the nation. So because of that, you could see how your students fared with students in other states. So one year, I don't know, North Dakota might be number one in the nation, and maybe Nebraska was 12th, or I don't know, Mexico or Alabama, or somebody was 40th or whatever. But comparing one state against another put too much pressure on educators and bureaucrats, and especially if their schools weren't the ones that were doing well. So to alleviate that pressure, states soon began making their own tests just for their students. That kept their states from being compared with other states. So the state who had been 47th or 49th or whatever no longer was. So having a test for each state removed the pressure for states to perform well when compared to other states. Now, additionally, tests are also regularly renormed, and especially when scores get too low. Often when a test is renormed, voila, school students are suddenly much smarter than what they were. Now, look at what happened with this national test. I've got, let's see, right here, or which way? Ah, there it is. See this test? You can see the scores on this test, and you can see how they had been high in 66, and then you see where they fell, and then they got low. Now look at the next point on the graph. Look what happens. That's where they renormed the test. Now you see at that renorming point, look what happened after they renormed the test. Boom, it's a skyrocket. Look how it shot through the roof. In only one year's time, students went from being the lowest that ever been on that test to being the highest in the history of the test. Now, how did kids get that smart in just one year? That's because they renormed the test. So that's, that's what happens when you renorm. They just, they, they can go through the roof. And that's the result of renorming. So once again, 
the pressure's off educators. When you renorm a test, everybody looks like they're doing great. Now, when I was a school principal, I tried an experiment once, and I, so I had our students take two separate versions of the same achievement test. I used the California achievement test, but with the norms from 1973, and I used the California achievement test with the norms of 1985. Now, generally, the kids usually got maybe two grade levels smarter or dumber, depending on which one of the two tests they took first. So the older the test, the more rigorous it was. Just as we saw earlier with the 1895 8th grade test and the 1862 4th grade test, renorming a test can often make test scores look better than what they really are. So in today's educational system, testing makes all the difference. Therefore, whoever writes a test and who determines what questions will be on the test has more influence on what happens in education than those who write the core standards or those who write the textbooks. Now, in the case of Common Core, not only do they have standards, but they've gone hand in glove with the academic assessment testing, and that's just one more of the many reasons that Common Core is not good for America. We've got a panel of folks. We've been busy all day, the last two days, actually. We've been going over, over all sorts of Common Core things. So we've got heroes here from states all over the country. We have legislators here. We have, uh, we, we have grassroots activists. We have communication specialists. And just looking over this, and one of the concerns that, that everybody's had has been over what happens with the academic assessment testing. Doesn't matter what district you live in, doesn't matter whether you have kids in school or not, this is what's happening in your district. It's what's happening in your schools. It's what's happening with, with Common Core. And this is why the assessment testing Common Core is such a, a bad thing right now. Contact your legislators, stand up, Common Core, lots on the blaze you can look at to get the information you need to make a difference in your community. Protect your kids from this stuff. Let them have a rigorous academic education. Get them good books. Good night from Dallas. The brief exposition of the Constitution of the United States will unfold to young persons the principles of Republican government. America has the most successful form of government of any nation in the history of the world. A good education is indeed a great good, but if not sanctified, it is odious to God. If you would like to know more about the rigorous academic standards and educational practices that were common in America's past, the DVD and booklet, Four Centuries of American Education, is available at wallbuilders.com. To continue building on the American heritage or to find books and other resources, visit wallbuilders.com. Founded by historian David Barton, Wall Builders is an organization focused on rebuilding the walls of America's unique religious, moral, and constitutional heritage by educating the public and encouraging people of faith to become active in the civil arena. Learn the truth of America's past so you can shape America's future. For more information, go to wallbuilders.com.